So now this is the last 1,000 years. So now let me take a very quick review or a focus ahead of the next 100 and the tasks ahead. Why? Because we are making 60 years and we have another 40 to make 100. So this is a good span to see where we should head uh, tomorrow. There are three things any leader who knows where we have come from should think about for the next 50 years to 100. One, narrowing the gross agricultural gap of our country. Gross agricultural gap is a measure of the return from the gross agricultural production of our farmers' harvest of crops, livestock, and others at current prices in relation to the cost of inputs, especially labor. The raw return to labor and low skill at many of our pre-industrial farms simply keeps the majority of our population poor and unable to move to industrial, uh, to industry, manufacturing, assembly, and production of goods of complexity. The very things that freed Britain and the West from decreasing returns from farming and from extreme poverty. This gap needs to be narrowed to make our agriculture competitive. This gap in our case is exacerbated, is increased by our case of availability of few tractors, equipment, irrigation, disease control, lack of standards that really make our companies compete. It is on account of this large gap between the return to the farmer and the inputs and availability compared with the subsidized farmer in Europe that makes our products partly uncompetitive here in the UK. How else can you explain the fact that for 150,000 metric tons of beef sold annually at the one market called Smithfield, one market alone, with a turnover of one billion British pounds, that Uganda sells no kilo at all. Yes, there are non-tariff trade barriers to get food into UK, but really the question is we are not organized for this market at a farm and a, an institutional level, and therefore we are not competitive, and this gap continues to expand. We need to narrow it in the next 40 to 100 years. The second thing that I think a leader should think about, looking at Uganda's tomorrow, really is related to the first, the quality of our public institutions and the high level of negative politicization of production and sales of our farm produce. Trade is war by other means, and few of our public officials see it or know it this way. This is the reason some of them take this business lightly and casually when our competition puts everything they are able to. Why is it war? Because it shifts the fortunes of nations. It is the reason why it is resisted by the markets we attempt to sell our goods in. I know that there is no country that has matured its economy without exports and trade, all effectively supported by a knowledgeable, highly skilled, caring, patriotic, and well-paid public service. We cannot compete and raise production and attract patient capital and build factories out of our farmlands unless we have a very supportive regulator who thinks like a business person and acts with haste, given we don't have time as a country. The competition has left us, and sometimes I feel like we see dust on the horizon in many of the key markets we try to sell in. Young leaders of NRM who are listening to me and all you Ugandans of all colors, stripes, political association, you really need to seek representation in these sectors of trade, of public service, and study more on how to bring more people into earning because this will sustain the NRM or any party that is in power whenever. It, it will sustain it over a long haul the way it has sustained Singapore's People's Action Party over the last 70 years. In other words, a rich population with organized political parties that have strong income, that understand trade, will stay longer, will be more useful for many more generations to come than focusing on the consumption of now and not building strong organizations. 
Finally, the third thing that I think we could think about for the coming years is to bring order and organization and modernity to our cultures and our customs, the things that often stand in the way of competing as people and institutions. It does not matter how much you have in natural resources, but without investing in organization in a much more structured and deliberate way to build institutions that outlast us, Africa will keep losing out. Industrial culture tends to organize people better and produces long-term benefits. If you have doubts about the value of organization, would you tell me why Zaire, which is present day DRC, Zaire under Mobutu then, which got similar amount and size of funding from the West under Cold War with Singapore, they both faced the same conditions, but Zaire had more natural resources, but Singapore turned out better at building a lasting, small Singapore, a lasting economy that still takes in more than three quarters of all foreign direct investment into Southeast Asia. By 2015, I know they were doing around 270 billion alone out of 350 billion in 2015, all the FDI that came to Southeast Asia. It tells me that organization beats resources. It is the biggest resource you can do to organize your people to compete. I thank you and I will take your questions now. I'd like to hear from you. Please email us at info at tapmedia.com and visit our website at www.tapmedia.com. You can also visit our offices located at Tomosi Business Park, Luzira, Port Bell Road or call 0414 220702. Thank you.